Thank you for downloading this sermon from Trinity Presbyterian Church in Spartanburg, South Carolina. For more information about Trinity, visit our website at www.trinityspartanburg.com. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. This is the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we pray that as we come to this passage that you would help us, you would illumine our minds to understand these glorious truths, that we would believe that our faith would be encouraged as we come to this passage of your inspired and inerrant word. Bless every one of our thoughts and meditations, you who are our rock and our redeemer. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be seated. This gospel of John begins with the same words that begin the Old Testament, in the beginning, in the Old Testament, in the beginning here. Of course, one's in Hebrew, one's in Greek, and uh, yet clearly meant to be um, echoing and reflecting one another, right? The Apostle John and the prophet Moses begin their inspired writings with that same phrase. They have the same meaning, right, and, and point to the time before anything visible or invisible was created. They point to the time, and it's, it's almost inconceivable, right? It's, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around there being a prior to space and time. But that is what we are dealing with here. A time before time, right, when only the infinite God existed. He does not... God does not have a beginning, right? Nor does he have an end. Time time is a mode of existence for creatures. But God, being infinite and eternal, can exist outside of or above or, let's use a lot of prepositions, right? Outside, above, or even in time, right? In the beginning points to that timeless existence. And really, what was revealed to John and is written in this first verse is this fact. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, was right there with his Father in that timeless eternity. Verses 1 and 2 make two amazing points. The Word was God, and the Word was with God. Right? So the Word was God, uh, a, a one-to-one identity. The Word was with God. There's some, some difference there. He was God and was with God. There's no way to understand that properly right? than, than uh, understanding the threeness of the one God, right? the, uh, the one essence and the three persons that the Christian church has held to. So Moses, Moses, thinking back on Genesis chapter 1, Moses gives us a zoomed out view of creation, right? John zooms in and we see the glorious tri-unity of the eternal God at work. He gives us more details of what's happening there in Genesis chapter 1. So in this passage, the Spirit reveals to us that Jesus Christ is the Word, He's the Word, or in the Greek, the the Logos. 
And how do we know that this Logos John refers to here in the beginning verses is the Jesus we worship? Well, he says so explicitly in, in verse 14, right? And the Word, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So anybody who tries to teach you that, that Jesus was merely a godly man, or that he was a, an enlightened prophet, or an inspired individual, or a man right, who became divine, has rejected the clear testimony of Scripture from these verses. Right? Jesus existed in the beginning, before the world was, and though he took on the flesh in his, in his humility, right, that does not mean he is something less than the infinite and eternal God. He and the Father are one. And they, through this written word, have revealed that to all people everywhere through all of time. And so, this, this glorious and mysterious trinity is really the focus of John's gospel. The union of and relationship between especially the, the Father and the Son, but the, the oneness of the essence and the distinctiveness of the persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is going to be one of the prominent themes as we work through this gospel over the next 16 years. And then I'll die. <laughs> now, I think it'll take 14 years. The Gospel of John is much more, I, I, I mean, and it's hard to say this, it's much more theological than the historical synoptic Gospels. It's, it's much more theological. Not that the synoptic Gospels are not theological, they're, they're theological as, uh, as, as anything else in Scripture, or that John's Gospel isn't historical because John's Gospel is historical. Um, they are that to the core. But John, by the Spirit's inspiration, was allowed to peek into the glories of the Trinity in a way that the other writers of the Gospels were not able to. There's a, the, the incredible vision, the incredible opportunity that he was given by the Spirit. Now, why is Jesus called the Word or the Logos? Why is Jesus called that? Well, first of all, only, only the Apostle, Apostle John calls Jesus the Word. Only, only John does that. In this passage, he does so in 1 John uh, chapter 1, right at the beginning, and also in Revelation chapter 19. All of these works written by the Apostle. And without going into all the debates about why he uses this Greek term logos, which which are, are endless and wearying, right? I think it's easiest just to understand Jesus being called the Word in this way. In calling Jesus the Word, the Spirit is teaching us that Jesus expresses perfectly the mind of God and that he also reveals God to man. That's what he does by being the Word, right? Um, he, Hebrews 1.3 says, Jesus is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of the Father's nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power, right? So Jesus is the radiance. He's, he's showing forth the radiance of the Father, and he is the exact representation of his nature. Jesus is the word of God then, in the sense that he expresses God's mind and reveals God's glory to man. That's what he does. That's what he is doing. Calvin interests you know, it, it, it stood out to me that Calvin translates this passage, in the beginning was the speech, and the speech was with God, and the speech was God. Um, he actually objects then in his commentary to the, worst, to the use of the word word. He says it should be speech. And then he defends Erasmus, who had been ripped up by some for using the word speech instead of word in his translations um, of John's gospel. Anyway, Calvin, 
Calvin says this, As to the evangelist calling the Son of God to speech, the simple reason appears to me to be, first, because he is the eternal wisdom and will of God, and secondly, because he is the lively image of his purpose. For as speech is said to be among men in the image of the mind, so it is not inappropriate to, pl- to apply this to God and to say that he reveals himself to us by his speech. He's saying the same thing that I said earlier, I think. Right? Jesus is the Logos in the sense that he expresses God's will and expresses the mind of God, so to speak. Right? And secondly, he is the image of God's purpose or in seeing the Logos work, we are seeing the Father's work. Right? In witnessing the, the son work, we're seeing the father work. Of course, John speaks to that later in his gospel. But these verses, as, as you can tell, we're just beginning to chip away at them, are incredibly dense. Incredibly dense verses. Um, J.C. Ryle in his commentary says, no, it, no man is worthy to even preach these verses or to think that he can explain them, right? You hold them in awe, you receive them by faith, and the Spirit is the one who reveals the meaning of these things to Christians. Verse 3, we learn that it was through the work of the Word that the creation of all things was accomplished. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Nothing at all has ever come into being that didn't come through Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Colossians. He says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Speaking of Jesus. But here's here's a question. Why does the Apostles' Creed... And almost all the theologians I read and the scriptures themselves say that the work of creation was the work of the Father, right? I mean, look at at your bulletins. I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth. We always, in Christian theology, attribute the work of creation to the Father, redemption to the Son, right? And... um, Isaiah 64, 8 says, But now, O Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. Right? Attributing that work of man to to the father. Well, in one sense, what... And now now we get into those those, uh, nooks and crannies of Trinitarian theology where I start feeling my uh, ineptitude. But there's a sense... We, we have to understand that what one of the persons of the Trinity does, all three of them do, okay? What one does, they all three do. So we can't make hard and fast distinctions between the persons, right? Scripture often speaks of one doing a specific work one place and then another person of the Trinity doing that exact same thing elsewhere, right? In fact, the work of creation We have it attributed to all three persons of the Trinity, to the Father, to the Son, and to the Spirit. Um, Genesis 1, 3, um, the Spirit is involved in that work of creation. But, But that's known that what one does they all do is known as the doctrine of inseparable operations, right? Pull that one out in your next Bible study, right? Impress people. The doctrine of inseparable operations. But, okay, having, having thrown that out, in another sense, Scripture attributes different works to the different persons, right? There are distinctions to be made between the three. The Father was not incarnate, right? Nor was the Spirit. The Son was begotten, but not the Father. Uh, the Son and the Father do not um, both Uh, The Spirit does not proceed, or does proceed from both the Father and the Son, right? But the the Son and the Father don't proceed from the Spirit. But again, in all these works, 
all three are engaged in ever in perfect agreement, and yet there's still distinctions. And it seems that creation is properly described as the work of the Father. Then why such strong statements by the Spirit in this passage in John about the Son's work of creation? Why that incredible passage in Colossians about the Son's work of creation? Well, um, this is very difficult stuff, mining the mind of God and entering into the eternal existence outside of time. Uh, Only God can fully understand himself. You realize that. Only God fully understands himself. We can't and never will fully understand him. But he has revealed himself to us in his word. So we can search for the answers to these questions in the word. And I think the answer to this question resides in a little conjunction. A little conjunction. Scripture says God created all things through Jesus. Through Jesus. Through his speech. Through the word. Right? Our passage says all things came into being through him. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, One Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. Colossians 1, 16 says, All things were created through him and for him. In other words, God the Son was the active agent carrying out the plans and directions of his Father. Right? He's the active agent that the Father is using to carry out his plans. And that is sweet, right? Because you know what delights the Son. The Son delights to do the will of his Father, right? And he's doing it here, even in the creation of all things. He, he wants to do as, he, uh, as his Father does. John 5, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. Now that's quite a statement of God. The Son can do nothing of Himself unless it is something He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. The Father's creating. The Son is the... Is, it's through the Son that, that He creates. The Father brought the Son into His work and the Son delighted to do what His Father was doing. In this sense, all of creation is the work of the Father accomplished through His Son. Fathers have a taste of that joy that the eternal Father and Son uh, had in creation. Fathers on earth have a taste of this when they draw their own sons into their work and see them enjoying their Father's work. That's glorious. One last thought on this agency of God the Father and God the Son. Ryle makes this warning. He says, There is no inferiority of God the Son to God the Father, as if God the Son was only the agent and workman under another. Nor yet does it imply that creation was in no sense the work of God the Father, and that he is not the maker of heaven and earth. But it does imply that such is the dignity of the eternal word, that in creation as well as in everything else, he cooperates with the Father. He cooperates with the Father perfectly, perfectly happy with one another. Indeed, we could take it even further. He submits to the Father, and that does not at all annihilate his equality with the Father. He submits. He does what the Father tells him to do. In the same way, wives submit to husbands, and that does not upend or overturn or besmirch their equal worth in the eyes of God. Now, there's still more density in this passage, okay? Verse 4, in him, in the Son, in the Logos, in Jesus Christ, was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, some like Calvin, say this means that the Son of God continues to preserve all things by his providence, right? He sustains life. He's the preserver of all things. Having created all things, he keeps all alive and in order. Others, like Zwingli, 
say that this includes all of life, not just mankind. It includes dogs and cats and cucumbers and broccoli, all those things, that God is the sustainer of those things. Still others, like Luther, say that this only applies to spiritual life. In other words, Jesus alone is the source of all life to the souls of men, whether in time or eternity. It's very clear that Jesus is the source of all life. If he created all things, he's the source of all life. God spoke in bears and bamboo, and bugs, and one more B, uh, babies existed. He spoke and those things existed. But given the purpose of John's gospel, which we find out at the end of John's gospel, verse 31 of chapter 20, which says, These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. I believe that the focus here is on that life that is given to believers, that eternal life that is the gift of those who believe. He is that life. He is life from the, from the dead. Jesus is the light of men, John writes, without him, because of Adam's sin and our connection to Adam, all is darkness. The whole world is wrapped up in darkness because it is fallen. It's wrapped up in sin. And so without the light of Jesus Christ, there is no light at all. There is no light at all without the light of Jesus Christ. That, that is a radical statement. Do you understand that is saying the only source of light in this world, the only source of eternal salvation, of knowledge of God, of knowledge of any righteousness, is to be found only in one place, in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. Many look to scientism for light, right? Many look to philosophy for light. Many look to Buddha for light. Many look to weed for light. Psychedelics, acid, LSD. Many look to entertainment for light. Many look to uh, relationships for light. Many look to money for light. But it is not found in any of those other things. Those are all darkness. Right? Why not? Because none of those things, think of this. Why do those things not carry light with them? Why do those things not teach us of eternal things? Well, because those things were not there in the beginning with God being God. Those things are created things. Right? Books and philosophy and science and hedonism, money, they're all created things. Jesus is the eternal, pre-existing light of all things. Even if those things afforded us any light, any knowledge, any truth, our hearts are so depraved naturally, right, so fleshly that we would not be able to perceive it even if it were there. <laughs> Think about this. And this takes us to that last statement. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Every man, without the help of God's Spirit, does not see the light of Jesus Christ. His world is all darkness. It's groping about in darkness, trying to find some light. Every man is so blinded by his sins that he cannot see. It is only by God's intervention, by God's loving intervention, that that our eyes are open, that our ears are unstopped, that our, our corrupt minds are unloosed so that we can think, our, our hard hearts that resist, that resist God are, are softened so that we may then see the glory of Jesus Christ. He who lived before creation, through whom all creation was made and who in the most loving action in the history of mankind, took on flesh. 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 
He took on flesh so that he might die. The light, the eternal light, the pre-existing eternal light took on flesh so that he could die in time. For you? For us? Miserable little creatures made out of dust? That's what happened. That's what has taken place. He fellowshiped in the love of his Father and the Spirit in the quiet. Think of the the blessed quietness of pre-creation existence. Right? None of the din of, of unsanctified prayers assaulting him constantly. None of the noise of sin of, of the earth. But Jesus fellowshiped in the love of his Father and with the Spirit in the quiet of pre-creation existence. And yet he entered the screeching noise of this world and her wars and her bickering and her pain and her oppression and her rapes and her murders and her hatred for his Father and he died for her. If it were not for his intercession, we, all, we are all by nature not even capable of loving or thanking this God. We are mastered by our flesh, and our flesh is hatred toward God. It's enmity toward God. We live in darkness not having eyes for light, right? But the light has come, and those not giving eyes do not and never will comprehend it. We'll never see it. What glory, though, that the light shines in darkness. What glory in the midst of death and disease and pandemic and economic hardship and wars and earthquakes and all the the damages that oppress this world because of Adam's sin. Then the, the second Adam has come and shined his light into that. And so, dear brothers and sisters, have you seen that light? Have you seen the light? Do you have eyes to see that light? Ryle says, Whatever deliverance from sin and spiritual death any child of Adam has ever enjoyed since the fall, whatever light of conscience or understanding anyone has obtained, all has flowed from Christ. The vast and listen to this, the vast majority of mankind in every age have refused to know him, have forgotten the fall in their own need of a Savior. The light has been constantly shining in darkness. The most have not comprehended the light. But if any men or women out of the countless millions of mankind have ever had spiritual life and light, they have owed it all to Jesus Christ, the light of the world. We've owed it to him. Now get into your mind how loving this God is. He is not just an impersonal force that somehow exists outside of time and then coolly watches over his creation like a a senile old man. No, not even before creation was he disinterested and unmoved. Right? But he was a father, and he was a son, and he was a spirit, rejoicing and loving themselves within themselves. Right? And he created mankind that he might share himself, right? that he might share himself with those creatures, and even after they rebelled against him and and destroyed their ability to relate with love to their creator, he continued to love them. He continued to love them. And then he makes stupendous promises. Right? While while they were still unlovely and they were still covered in their own filth, the filth of sin, and he makes these lovely promises to redeem them from their slavery and bring them to him through his son. Dear brothers and sisters, this is the history of the world. 
This is the history of all histories. The scientists like to think that they have determined the history of the world by their little microscopes and their telescopes and their mathematical formulas and their theories. But they do not have revelation. And they have refused a place for God, whose existence alone makes sense of why we love and why we grieve and why we hope and why we have bad consciences and why we stand in awe of the sunsets and the stars. There is and always has been a God who is love. And that God created us to know Him. I mean, it's, it's, it's glorious. That eternal God created us to know Him. And when all was lost, he, he sacrificed his son that they might see his light, that they might know his love, that they might eternally bask in, in his light which will outshine the light of the sun. That is reality. There is a personal God who is there and who loves you. You are precious in his sight. He is not, uh, he is not like cool gravity and impersonal force. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He watches every one of your goings, outs, and comings in. He watches. And his son, happily, because he loves his father, his son happily entered into this cesspool of wickedness. Though he was God and had thrown the stars into their positions in space, Right? He enters into this cesspool and he enters into it to find you, to rescue you, to clean you up, to dignify you with an eternal dwelling place in heaven, you know, where no one will ever molest you or trouble you and not one bit of your flesh will ever have the upper hand in that place. If you know Jesus Christ, you have entered into the eternal existence of the infinite God. You have become partakers of the divine nature, as the scriptures say. All that is left for you is to struggle through this life, engaged in the warfare with the flesh, and then an eternal Sabbath in which you worship and study and feast in the presence of this infinite God. Yet, dear brothers and sisters, just as eternal as his attribute of love is, is his attribute of justice. You have heard Jesus Christ preach today, and that, along with the testimony that God's creation has given each of you, leaves you without excuse. You are now, everybody here today is without excuse, having heard Jesus preached. If you do not come to him and, and, and you continue to love the darkness and, rather than the light, you will allow God to eternally express his justice against those who heard of his son and rejected him. And all that is left for you is to be led around by your flesh for the rest of your existence, then an eternal punishment in which every intent of the thoughts of your heart will only be hatred toward this loving God all the time. Why would you reject such a great salvation? That, that, is, that is yours simply through faith, like we read of in Romans 4. Will some mere mortal's theory about apes and explosions really be that which keeps you in the darkness? Will some sin which has you under its spell be that which keeps you in the darkness eternally? Will some, some 19th century piece of artwork or some piece of literature, some piece of fiction be that which keeps you in the darkness? Will your unwillingness to even contemplate the fact that you will die someday be that which keeps you in the darkness? 
No, no, no. Don't let it be. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. He was in the beginning. He was with God. He is God. All things came into being through him. He is life, right? He is the light of men, and he is shining now in the darkness. Do you see him? Do you see Jesus Christ? Will you Will you ask the Spirit to reveal Him to your heart and to your mind? Will you leave behind the rotting corpus of works of men and open your heart to the infinite source of life and light? God is our reality. His presence in heaven will be peace everlasting. Right? Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen?